Hello, welcome to the EPG Partshala program in linguistics. Today we will discuss module 29, distinctive features. In this module, we will acquaint you with the theory of distinctive features, the set of distinctive features that are in use today, the basic goals of the lingu theory of linguistic features, the history, very brief history of distinctive feature theory and some other re relevant issues. What is the need for a theory of distinctive features? Notice that in a discipline such as phonetics, which is a scientific discipline, it is necessary to be able to distinguish each phonetically distinct sound. Now, in order to do that, we have in the first instance the international phonetic alphabet with which you are already familiar. So, when we have different sounds which occur even slightly differently, but the distinction is recognized, we have symbols and diacritics to distinguish them. Thus, we have terms such as voiceless, unaspirated, plosive. If it is glottalized, then we say voiceless, glottalized, unaspirated, plosive. When we have a set of sounds, then we make sure that the labels that we use distinguish each of those sounds. In addition to this need to have labels for distinguishing sounds, we also need to go into the various processes that are taking place in languages. For example, in a language such as Khadiya, there are 33 consonants and of course vowels and other sounds. Of the 33 consonants, there are four consonants only, namely B, D, J and G that are glottalized in a certain context. Now, if we want to find reasons, why is it that only those four, four consonants are glottalized? Why not other consonants glottalized? If we want to go into an explanation of some of these processes, then we find that the distinctive feature notion is of use. How? How is distinctive feature notion important here? When we try to explain as to why only ba, da, ja, ga are glottalized and not the others, we find that ba, da, ja, ga form a somewhat like a group, which we call a natural class. What is the natural class? These are plosives and these are all voiced and these are all unaspirate. Now, these plosives which are voiced <coughs> are the only ones which belong to this category. There are other plosives, but these plosives do not go into this process of glottalization. So, voiced unaspirated plosives, ba, da, ja, ga, thus form a natural class. So that sounds such as bha or a ma or a la are not included in this group. Now, it is one thing to state it, to state that birth, the jagger form a natural class. But it is another thing to try to present it, try to write in the form of a rule that is an explicit rule, to be able to show that this is a natural class. So, we want to make a distinction between a statement and a description. A description should be in scientific terms. When we want to take our discipline to a scientific level, it becomes necessary for us to make predictions about what a natural class is. When we want to make predictions about a natural class, characterize a natural class, then we find that the notion of distinctive features comes of critical help. Now, the theory of distinctive feature has this hypothesis with which most phonologists work and that is there is a small set of distinctive features. 
probably two dozen, which are at the basis of all speech sounds, distinctions. So a combination of these distinctive features gives us different sounds in world languages. That is one. Secondly, these distinctive features are involved in the phonological processes in different languages. The distinctive, this hypothesis of distinctive features which has these two aspects, one there is a limited set of them and the other they are involved in phonological processes. This hypothesis that distinctive features form a small set and distinctive features are used in various processes is based on an exact investigation of hundreds of languages that have been described. A very good place where you can find the sounds of languages presented is Ian Madison's and also there are many other inventories which have been published for different languages such as Tibeto-Burman languages or Indic languages. What we find is that the set of these 22 or so more or less features are adequate to distinguish all these speech sounds that are found in, in world languages. Now what does a distinctive feature theory has to achieve? There are three main goals of a dis theory of distinctive features as you see them on the screen. They should be capable of characterizing natural segment classes. They should be capable of describing all segmental contrasts in world languages. They should be definable in phonetic terms. We have looked at the first two aspects of the goals of a distinctive feature theory. The last one is the one which aims at making the theory of distinctive features verifiable. <coughs> it is only when the distinctive features are phonetically defined that we can find them to be falsifiable as well. That is when we define distinctive features are having certain phonetic categories we can go and test them whether those phonetic, phonetic definitions are found to be true or not true. The history of distinctive features. Notice that in an informal way distinctive features were introduced in Panini's Ashtadhyay when the sound various natural classes are put in different groups. It was assumed that they shared some phonetic properties. However, a linguistic theory does not develop through assumptions, a theory has to make explicit statements and explicit claims. The first theory of distinctive features then that was proposed by was in the 50s by Roman Jakobsen, Fant, Gunnar Fant and Maurice Halle. These phoneticians and phonologists and linguists of great caliber proposed a very small set of distinctive features first, something like a set of eight distinctive features. As phonologists came to investigate the adequacy of these features, it was soon found that there were many distinctions that could not be made with the set of these eight distinctive features. So one of the proponents, Maurice Haller then, co-authored the well-known book called Sound Patterns of English or SPE for short in which the authors Chomsky and Halle proposed a set of about 29 distinctive features. So the number rose. These distinctive features were mostly articulatorily defined. In later years it was found that some of the distinctive features were redundant. Also some of the features were not really features, distinctive features because they could be predicted <coughs> in terms of phonological representations such as stress, tone, etc. And thus an attempt was made to constrain the theory of distinctive features. Later work 
<coughs> on distinctive features made it possible for us to have a theory of distinctive features which can, which can help explain various processes of phonology in different world languages. This development in the final stages known as feature geometry will be taken up in the next course on advanced phonology. Now here we will look at these distinctive features <coughs> as they have come to be in use today without going into the theory of their representation <coughs> in terms of feature geometry. But these features are the ones which are there in use today. Before we get, go to take a look at the distinctive features in use today, it is necessary to note the following points about the distinctive features. Number one, the distinctive features have by and large binary values, which means they are specified in terms of plus and minus. For example, plus voice, minus voice, plus consonantal, minus consonantal, etc. Some features are assumed to be single valued. That means they don't have plus minus value, but they are just there. For example, labial. So a sound is either labial or not labial. It is not necessary for us to say that, let us say, la is plus minus labial. La is just not labial. There are features like this which are stated in terms of monovalent features or single valid features. The third point is about distinctive features being distinctive and non-distinctive. There are some languages in which a feature may be distinctive, but there are other languages in which the same feature may not be distinctive. For example, in most Indo-Aryan languages, the feature aspiration for which we have the distinctive feature plus minus spread glottis. This feature is distinctive because the sounds pa, pa, ba, bha are distinguished. We have minimal pairs. The meanings of words change if we use one or the other. In English too we have aspirated sounds. As we all know, we have pa, pa, ta, ta, etc. However, the, the feature aspiration is not distinctive in English. The feature is there, but it is not distinctive. It is distinctive purely at the level of the pronunciation of sounds or the perception of sounds, but it does not have a contrastive function in the language. How do we account for features which are distinctive in one language, not distinctive in another language, but are there, for example, plus minus aspirated in English? It is assumed that distinctive features may lie dormant at some level and may be activated at a later level. For example, the feature plus minus spread glottis is activated right at the start. The feature plus minus as, uh, spread glottis is not activated at the beginning, but it gets activated late so that we have different allophones which are aspirated and aspirate. It is likely that some of these features are never activated in a specific language. For example, in Tamil, we do not find aspirated sounds at all. Even other sounds which could be said to be to have plus spread glottis feature such as ha are absent in Tamil. So in Tamil we assume that the feature plus minus activate plus minus. So in Tamil we assume that the feature plus minus spread glottis is never activated. We thus have a set of distinctive features, a universal set of distinctive features. The fact that the features may be activated early or activated late or not activated at, at all accounts for the role of distinctive features in different ways and the organization of sounds in terms of these distinctive features in different ways in different languages. But the set, however, 
can give us all the possible distinctive sounds in world languages and that is why they are called distinctive features. There are four sets of distinctive features namely major class features, laryngeal features, manner type features and place features. The major class features give us the major classes of sounds such as vowels, consonants, sonorants, approximants. The laryngeal type features give us the different types of sounds distinguished by the larynx such as voiced, voiceless, aspirated, etc. The manner type features give us the different manners of the articulation of sounds such as plosives, fricatives, etc. And then the place features give us the different places of articulation of vowels and consonant sounds. The major class features as you will see in the e-text material that you will be reading are mainly three that we use today. We use the features plus minus syllabic. This gives us vowels on the one hand and those consonants which are not syllabic on the other. So syllabic consonants are plus syllabic along with vowels and non-syllabic consonants are minus syllabic. Then what about non-syllabic, the difference between non-syllabic consonants and syllabic consonants? <coughs> we have the feature plus minus consonantal to distinguish consonants, syllabic consonants from vowels. So syllabic consonants are plus syllabic plus consonant compared to vowels which are plus syllabic minus consonant. Then we have the major class feature called minus plus sonorant. So we have sounds which are distinguished as obstruents such as plosives, fricatives and affricates and sonorants such as all the other consonant types as well as vowels. So we have two different classes on the basis of whether they are sonorant or non-sonorant. Then we have the feature, fourth feature called plus minus approximant. That is sounds are approximants or sounds are not approximants. Now these are phonetically defined. For example, a plus syllabic sound is one which occupies the nucleus position in a syllable. The plus consonantal sound is one in the production of which there is some obstruction in the oral cavity. A plus sonorant sound is one in the production of which the air flow both inside the mouth and outside is the same. And plus approximant is a sound in the production of which there is no clear obstruction in the passage of air in the oral cavity. So these are well phonetically well defined terms and they give us the major classes of sound. Laryngeal features are features which have to deal with the larynx, the position of the vocal folds in the larynx. As we know that there are many different types of sounds which are produced by the larynx. The following are the most important, plus minus voice. So when the vocal cords vibrate, we have plus voice. When they do not vibrate, they are kept apart we have minus voice sounds plus minus spread glottis when the glottis is widely spread we get aspirated sounds when the glottis is not widely spread we get unaspirated sounds plus minus constricted glottis <coughs> these are sounds which are glottalized either glottal stop or glottalized sounds both glottalized and preglottalized sounds consonants or vowels. Manner features. These features give us the various manners of articulation. <coughs> the feature plus minus continuant gives us the difference between fricatives on the one hand and plosives on the other. <coughs> Recall that we already have a feature minus sonorant to give us features fricatives, affricates and plosives as one group. Now within this group when we want to distinguish let us say fricatives from 
plosives and affricates. For example, plosives and affricates are aspirated in English. Then we should be able to distinguish between these two groups. We have the feature plus minus continuant. So fricatives are minus sonorant plus continuant. Plosives and affricates together are minus sonorant minus continuant. Now if we want to distinguish affricates from plosives then we need another distinctive feature. That feature is plus minus delayed release. That is whereas affricates are plus delayed release in the, in the release of articulators involved in the production of affricates the release is slow and in the release of plosives the release is sudden. Thus minus sonorant plus minus sonorant plus minus continuant plus minus delayed release gives us all the three manners of articulation which are obstruents between and within them the groups such as plosives and affricates versus fricatives or plosives and affricates versus fricatives and each one of them separately they can be described with the help of distinctive features. Remember that the goal of distinctive feature theory is to be able to characterize natural classes and these sounds such as plosives and affricates or they together or together with fricatives they form natural classes involved in different types of rules and the distinctive features that <coughs> are used in use today help us distinguish all of them whenever there is need to characterize a natural class. There are other features which are of which distinguish different manners of articulation such as plus minus nasal, plus minus lateral and plus, min plus minus approximant. These are some of the most important manners of articulation. The approximants give us laterals and semi-vowels like wire, nasals, of course nasal, lateral, laterals and so on. It is uh, interesting to observe at this stage that <coughs> it is not the case that all the features are unambiguously defined and distinguished. Although the definition may be, may be clear, but the way some of the sounds function in languages, the way they group in languages may be ambiguous. And thus we do not have a single classification of some of these sounds which can belong to one group now, another group later. For example, laterals. In many languages, laterals go as continuant sounds like fricatives or vowels at least vowels often and in some other language they go as non-continuant sounds. So the use of the distinctive feature to characterize sounds is based ultimately on the function of these sounds in natural classes. This is an important point and needs to be taken into account. Although we find that there is a considerable amount of consistency in the way the sounds function as natural classes. The place features, these are <coughs> four main types, namely labial, coronal, dorsal and radical. These deal with four different parts that <coughs> are involved in the articulation of sounds in the oral cavity, starting from the lips, going on to the the blade of the tongue going on to the body of the tongue and finally the root of the tongue. So the root is radical, the body is <coughs> dorsal and the blade tip etc are coronal, the lips are labial. If a natural class has to be described in terms of any one of these then these are monovalent features. So we simply say labial or coronal or dorsal or radical. Within each of these however we have again further spe 
specifications of distinctive features. For example, coronal sounds are either plus anterior, minus anterior or <coughs> they are plus distributed, minus distributed. So this gives us these binary feature values of distinctive features and the reach of these heads gives us all the different possible sounds that are found in world languages. It is interesting to know that when we talk about the place features, we have many features that are commonly used for consonants and vowels. For example, <coughs> we find that the feature plus minus high, plus minus back, which are used for as dorsal features are used commonly for consonants and vowels. Thus palatal sounds are <coughs> plus high minus back like E which is plus high minus back. Dorsal sounds consonants are plus high plus back like K or a G. Similarly, U is plus high and plus back. So there is also evidence from natural languages of the common association amongst these groups of sounds, both consonants and vowels. Among the radical sounds, we do not have many distinctions. Uh, sometimes this, this, this area is one where although we have different sounds such as pharyngeals and uh, uvulars, but languages tend to have mainly <coughs> uh, one of them as contrastive sounds. These are also much rarer <coughs> in different languages. And we know that as we go further down, the <coughs> sounds are already taken care of by the sounds which can be said to have to do with the glottis. And we know that as we go further down, we have sounds which are of the laryngeal types in the production of which the larynx is critically involved. So to summarize the discussion for today, we have looked at the need for distinctive feature theory, the need also to have it well defined, made falsifiable, the goals of a distinctive feature theory, and then the sets of distinctive feature theory that are in use today. A brief history of distinctive feature theory was also given, but some readings are suggested which you can go to in order to have a first hand information about the development of the distinctive feature theory. Thank you.